Podcast Therapeutic Radiog for Lead Oncology Podcast. Welcome to podcast number 106. My name is Naman Joker Anderson and I'm joined by fellow host Joe McNamara. Hi everyone. Uh, so a big thank you to our last guests who were uh, Joe and I, where we talked about common terminology uh, for radiotherapy. So if you haven't had a chance yet, uh, please do go and take a listen. So we're very pleased to introduce our guest today, Richard Baker, who will be discussing his role as the UK Engineering Manager for Genesis Care. Hi Richard, how are you? Hi, uh, yeah, I'm all right, thank you, yeah. Yeah, you? Thank you for joining us. And we, I've, I feel very underdressed now, looking at you on camera <laughs> right now. Um, yeah. But would you like to just introduce yourself, tell us a bit about how you got to where you are in your career? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I've basically been an engineer for since I was a child, been messing around with cars and bikes and tinkering in the garage. Um, so then when I bought my first house, I decided uh, I needed to rewire it. So I went to college to learn how to be an electrician. Uh, that sort of grew from there. And then the father-in-law was a builder. So I kind of helped him and kind of with the practical skills and everything else. Um, but my first love's always been cars and car engines and bits and bobs like that. And uh, yeah, then, then through my life, you know, various things happen. And then um, at some point I thought, well, I decided uh, I needed to settle down and get a mortgage and everything else. So, so kind of um, a few divorces along the way, and then in later life, just decided to uh, get a get a st- I'll work for myself for a bit, and then get a steady job in the NHS. So I joined as an electrician at Cheltenham uh, quite a few years ago now. And uh, while I was there, there was um, some nurse call systems and things like that that we had to service. So basically, I was always over the uh, the electronics workshop for radiotherapy, uh, borrowing the odd resistor or the, the odd electronic component. And, uh, and that kind of naturally led me, led me into, uh, looking at Linux. And I can quite honestly say my, uh, my eyes fell out my head when I first saw a, saw a Linux. <laughs> um, so then, yeah, then when a job came up, I applied and, and thankfully I got it. And, uh, I haven't looked back since and that was sort of 15 16 years ago and yeah my life's changed ever since <laughs> you mentioned how your eyes popped out your head do you remember that moment for kind of your prosperity of anyone else who's maybe interested in a career in engineering working in radiotherapy as that first initial reaction of gosh that's a big machine that looks really complex i can i can honestly say hand on heart I remember that moment and what gives me joy probably more than anything else when I'm doing talks about the machine to patients and and to staff and, and anyone who's interested who will stand there long enough really um, I drag them in and show them the machine and one of the best parts of the machine I, I you know do a presentation this is how it works and then you take them in the back and on an Alexa you've got the doors uh, on the very and you've got the covers on the side so um, when you take the people in the back, you you always hear, a, oh my goodness, and that bit, and that is just, that's the wow moment. And for anybody who's got any inkling of engineering, that's when their eyes fall out their head and they go, oh my goodness, that is amazing. You must have seen linear accelerators change and develop a lot throughout your career. Yeah, so... Yeah, <laughs> started working on the old the old variants a long time ago. Um, yeah, they, they see the the thing is the basic principles of the accelerator are still the same and have been for for tens of years. Um, you know, probably knocking back nearly a hundred years now. So, um, so the basic principles of how the accelerator actually works inside and accelerates the electrons are just under the speed of light and all that sort of stuff is basically the same. But the bits that change are all the bits that are sort of bolted onto it that give the sort of the guided radiotherapy, the the MLCs where we shape the beam coming out towards the patient. So we're covering the bits of the patient that we don't want to get irradiated. Um, so the, the technology has moved on. <clears throat> the machines are, are, are a lot better and um, a bit more sympathetic to the engineer now than they used to be. Um, but the, the the sort of advances in technology are the bits around the machine, you know, where they're looking at the patient and actually, you know, we, you know, part of the goal of radiotherapy is to get get the radiation into the 
into the sort of treatment area with minimizing the damage to the healthy tissue and that has just come on in the last 10 years leaps and bounds um yeah amazing how did you learn about how to work as an engineer in radiotherapy richard because I've been a bit naive, but going from kind of the background that you were involved in to then servicing and running linear accelerators, that sounds like a bit of a learning curve. Wow, yeah. I mean, I I remember, yeah, I, I always remember the first day I was left alone in the department after I'd done all my training and, you know, you help people on services and you help people on breakdowns and there's, oh, there's always that safety net there's always somebody with you and I remember the first day that that my colleague went home at dinner time and I'm there in the afternoon now looking after six accelerators on my own and I've got to make the decisions on them and I'm like oh no <laughs> so yeah massive learning curve I mean there's Anybody who says that you know everything about how an accelerator works and everything about the accelerators is probably not telling the truth. Um, there's there's so many different bits inside the machine. It's just unbelievable. And you know you can yeah you can learn about how or how we use this, these bits to accelerate the electrons and bits and bobs and everything else. And then you can delve down into the physics. And and even a lot of physicists will look at that and go, you say, well, how do, how do we impart the energy onto the electrons in the second part of the accelerator? And they go, well, well yeah, there's, there's, there's all these equations and stuff. So, you know, the, the learning never stops. And you can go as deep as you want to go on these things. And it's just, for, for somebody who's got an inkling in engineering or just an inkling of how things work, oh, my goodness, what, what, a, what, a, what a journey, what a sort of, what a thing to be involved with. So imagine Richard, Joe and I are sitting treating a patient right now. Could you explain to the patient on the bed what's happening once, I don't know, Joe presses the, the button to switch the linear accelerator on, deliver the beam. How would you explain it to a patient of what's about to happen to them? So just if we just go really basic, so we basically we take three phase voltage, we fill up some capacitors um, to maybe... Oof, See, the trouble is I don't want to scare people that are listening. But we fit up capacitors. Bear with me because we get to the good bit at the end, guys. So we fit up capacitors to kind of maybe 19,000 volts, 26,000 volts. And not just, you know, not just at uh, millivolts. They're, they're at megavolts. So we've got enough power once those capacitors are charged to run a like a small town, basically. Um, and that works um, by filling it up like a toilet cistern. So... Um, you don't have a massive amount of electric coming into these machines it's just a standard three-phase supply um, and then basically we fill these capacitors up like we do a toilet cistern and then we we flush the toilet so we we flush all that power so I when I speak about all the power being enough to run a town it, albeit for three millionths of a second we then send that power down to to two places on the electro machine so we send it to the, the magnetron which everybody's got in their microwave at home. So we put a big pulse of energy in one end, uh, out the other end comes microwaves. Um, and then the other place it goes to what we call an electron gun. And it's not actually a gun, but I'll explain why we call it a gun. So we got uh, the magnetron, we pulse it in the one end. So your magnetron at home in your microwave might be 800 to 1000 watts. Um, the one in our machine can be up to sort of six, seven million watts maximum power. Um, so, and I always hear patients, so please, if there are any patients listening, please don't panic, don't panic, oh my goodness, I always hear patients in the waiting room saying, oh, we're going to be microwave today, you know, um, yes, we use microwaves, it's really important in the process of accelerating the electrons, but no microwaves come out towards the end of the patient, okay, so, um, so we use these high power microwaves, they basically go down a, a tube into a into an accelerator so it's like a you know the thing at CERN that collides the particles it's just a really small version of that so it's about two meters long about five inches round and it's under a really high vacuum um, and basically the microwave power fills up that tube um, and then the other part of the when we flush our toilet of electric goes to the electron gun and when the microwave power is uh, propagated in the, in the accelerator we release a bunch of electrons off the electron gun um, so it's basically a small coil of tungsten 
um, that just sits there and boils off electrons. Um, and then we put the high voltage across that in the tube and that accelerates a bunch of electrons into the ch into the accelerator at 0.4 of the speed of light. Um, so that's quite fast. And then basically, so if we go to another another uh, analogy, so if you imagine the microwaves like the waves on the sea and then the electrons are somebody on a surfboard. Um, when you see somebody uh, on, the on the sea, if they just sit on their surfboard, they'll just bob up and down on the wave. Um, when a wave comes that looks looks nice and fancy, they paddle like crazy, get to the sort of get a bit of speed up. The wave catches them, and pew, and off they go in towards the shore. Well, that's kind of what we're doing. So the the electrons are sat there, and then we give them a bit of point four of the speed of light pew, into the accelerator, and uh, they catch the wave. And then basically, what they do this these bunches of electrons get accelerated to just under the speed of light. So to give a bit of context around that. Um, that's around the world seven times in a second uh, to the moon and back in three so um, so basically and then those electrons are what we use as radiation to treat the patient so any microwave power that's used to accelerate those electrons is diverted off and turned into heat there's like an aerial uh, what we call a water load so there's a water system on the machine that keeps it cool um, so basically the microwaves are diverted off and then what we get at the end is bunches of electrons towards the patient and that's the radiation we use um, to treat the cancer and the, the premise is that the radiation whether it be uh, so we can turn it into x-rays so we if we hit the electrons into a tungsten target we can uh, we can get x-rays out the other side um, so depending on what the consultant might decide uh, your treatment is whether it's close to the skin or inside the body we would use electrons or x-rays um, and the premise is it's really simple does what it says on the tin the radiation it damages the DNA in the cells um, the cancer cells die off and don't come back and the healthy cells do come back and that's where the advancements in technology come in uh, and all the research that's gone in lately is to is to really minimize the damage to all the healthy tissue around the treatment area and all the organs that are you know maybe if you if you're treating a breast you know your heart could be in and out of the radiation field so we're kind of shaping the field with what we call the multi-leaf collimator so it's basically a big uh, bank of tungsten leaves that block the radiation and can cause a shape so um, they work basically like if you've seen the the tool that you push against a skirting board that makes the shape you know so um, if anybody hasn't seen it you can google I it always maybe. Want one of I don't those, know. Richard. they look amazing uh, on Instagram they're always trying to flog it to me Oh, are they? Yeah. So you know, so um, so the MLC is basically like two two of those tools, and as the radiation's coming out towards the patient, basically the the patient has a CT scan before the treatment, and once they've had the CT scan, the the oncologist, uh, the dosimetrist, the planners will all look at this CT scan and decide uh, what shape they want the radiation into what part of the uh, treatment area. And then they program that into our planning system, which then goes into the machine, which then brings these these tools that make your skirting board, you know, fancy, um, bring these tools and then they, they come together and block the radiation. So if you imagine a radiation like a beam of light, um, these tools will come in and they'll block the light and then they'll they'll leave a shape. So we can leave any shape we want, circle, egg shape, whatever. Um, and basically hone in on different parts of the treatment area. Um, and and these things are accurate to within sort of less than a millimeter, so um, the the treatments are really accurate and really safe. And that's the reason you have the two week wait between your CT scan, which is usually two weeks, and your treatment is because what they're doing is they're looking at your CT scan and planning where all these little leaves are going to go to leave what shape they want to leave to treat the treat the radi treat the tumor. And then you come in for maybe five fractions. Um, basically, what we're doing is giving the healthy tissue a chance to recover and the cancer cells will just keep dying off but we don't want to give too much radiation at once to the healthy tissue so we it's all been calculated through research that we just give a little bit and then it recovers little bit recovers so um, basically the cancer cells keep dying off and the healthy cells don't and, and, and recover so that's the premise of it. it does what it says on the tin uh, it's really accurate so the machines are big and noisy the point they rotate around is accurate to within 1.5 millimeters usually 
or two millimeters so we've got a millimeter tolerance each side um, the gantry that rotates around can weigh between six and seven tons um, it's accurate to within point one of a degree um, is that Richard why sometimes patients will say or oh, can hear a bit of creaking you know maybe an older machine <laughs> Is, is that why sometimes you get the odd creak just because of the weight of the machine? Yes and no. Uh, it's usually because the covers are just a bit old and crunky. But yeah, um, yeah. There, there's a lot of things that go on inside the machine that move um, that can cause uh, cause creaking and crunking. Yeah, there's there's lots of different. <laughs> um, yeah, quite often we, we try and grease them up and keep them lubricated as much as we can. But quite often when they're going around it... <laughs> sometimes in there and I always think to myself oh my goodness what must it be like for a patient to be led on the bed not understanding what the machine looks like and what it's doing and then hearing this creaking crunking noise and it must be really sort of disconcerting for the patient to actually um to be led there and think oh my goodness is it going to fall on me or you know <laughs> I can categorically tell you that it's that, not but yeah they're very it's not. accurate aren't they they it is oh, my maintained goodness. and looked after <laughs> The, the yeah so people uh, question people often ask actually and when we've been we've been asked today actually at work is um you know because my machine's sort of eight nine years old is it is it is it at any more risk of you know is it is it on its way out is it knackered um you know and actually it's a bit like uh for those of a certain age you'll remember triggers broom from only fools and horses yeah, I'm looking at these two on the on the podcast. They got no idea. Oh, what I'm talking I about. definitely know. Oh, you do. Yeah, will okay. not know. <laughs> so, um, so triggers broom. So he's had sort of 43 heads and 42 handles or whatever. Um, so basically, an old accelerator. If anything breaks or anything goes wrong with it or anything suspect, um, or it need, you know, we we have a very sort of strict uh, planned maintenance program. So if anything actually sort of starts going wrong with a machine or goes wrong, it gets replaced. So an old machine, yes, the frame of it might be old, but actually it's just as just as serviceable as a new machine, really, um, because everything's sort of been replaced. So, and and in actual fact, our you know I've been in places where we've had a new machine fitted, and that's been a lot more sort of had more downtime than than the old machines because we've kept the old machines up together and serviced them and then the new one comes in and it's like you know so um so yeah it's it's interesting but yeah they they still like i say they still stay really really accurate they're really really safe i won't go into the you know i've, I've waffled enough about how they work but um you know the fact they work at all is an absolute miracle because of the if you go down into the sort of physics of the electrons being accelerated you know, I talked about them being on a surfboard, but actually, there's tons more stuff. If you go down to the physics, it's a miracle the machine even works. Let alone, let alone, you know. So, um, and there's iron chambers that are checking how much radiation's coming out in the mornings. The rads do a separate check in the mornings to make sure that the machine, what the machine's saying, the output is, is matching what their independent equipment is. So there's a whole team of engineers that sit behind the scenes that keep these machines maintained and fixed and there's a whole team of physicists that sit behind the scenes that keep these machines accurate, safe, tuned. Um, you know, and the patients they never see us unless well, unless the machine's broken, they see us walking through the waiting room with a with a tool bag or, or something and then you hear all the oh no. Um but apart from that, we we kind of we live in the shadows, you know, um, and so do the physicists. A lot, of, lots of late nights and weekends, sort of fixing things and checking things and everything else. And uh, you know, Richard, can I ask it, you about that? Yeah. Because a lot of the patients will say, "I don't understand why you don't treat on weekends or don't treat through the evenings," because of the fact that obviously cancer cells don't sleep on a weekend; they are still reproducing. So. It, I just think it might be interesting for patients to realise what goes on um, on weekends and in evenings and why, unfortunately, we can't run a 24-7 service. Yeah, so like I say, there, there, there's, there's tons of stuff that goes on. There's servicing, um, you know, and some of the items on the servicing, some services can sort of take six or eight hours, um, depending on which bit you're servicing on the machine. Um, and then the physics checks, I mean... So basically, the physics checks can range from just putting a, a profile under a profiler under the beam to just sort of check what's coming out, or actually 
but they get um they can put like the water tank what they call the water tank underneath so it's a big uh, for the patient a big tank of water our bodies are like water um so we can basically put detectors in the water and then beam the machine on and we can detect what energy is coming out but then we can move that detector down in the water and down in the depth um which then simulates uh the radiation going through the body as such so then we can get different plans for um where the radiation at what depth what the radiation looks like at what depth um as it sort of comes through the water uh, there's a lot more to it than that and a physicist will probably shoot me because i'm saying something wrong but um but there's tons of stuff that goes on behind the scenes and uh yeah sometimes it's it's so it's, it's, if only people knew how complicated how safe how accurate the machines are you know one of the things that have come out from me doing these talks to patients has been they have a better understanding of why the machine breaks um you know they're a bit more sympathetic because you know these machines are you know if it say for instance something goes wrong and we have to adjust the beam slightly that's not just oh we adjust the beam and give it back we adjust the beam and then a physicist has to come along and sit with us and then maybe do two or three hours of calibration and checking to make sure that what we've adjusted is actually right or if we you know if a potentiometer fails on the couch um, so every movement on the machine's got at least three or four potentiometers me measuring it. So if one fails, um, the other two go, well, I don't, I don't know where you are, and it stops the machine. Um, so something as simple as a potentiometer failing can, you know, if we've got to dig down and pull the couch apart, could be uh, maybe a two-hour fix, and then uh, possibly, you know, an hour's work of physics checks. You know, so it, it's quite interesting that, you know these little things that when they depending on what it is these little things when they fail can actually lead to a lot of downtime just because of the checks needed afterwards to make sure the machine's safe how many safety Check mechanisms the, are there sorry. so there's probably t oof, uh, probably between 1200 and 2000 parts on the machine being checked so about 20 times a second i would say so um the machine is constantly monitoring where it is where every part of the machine is anything that moves that is critical to patient treatment is monitored at least three or four times uh, voltages are all monitored uh, air pressure air temperature humidity all these things are being monitored um, where the beams coming out so the the iron chamber picks up where the radiation's coming out and tells us if it's in the right place or not that also tells us what the energy of the radiation is um, so that is that's got two separate power supplies so if one starts going going up the wall then it says right oh I don't, I don't know where I am and it stops um, yeah there, there's there's a water cooling system on the machine there's a high vacuum on the machine that's all being monitored there's uh, SF6 gas which is quite interesting gas um, that the microwave tube is filled up with um, so yeah it is like honestly the amount of stuff that's being checked on the machine it's like having a million computers and just bolting them onto this thing that moves and then expecting them all to talk to each other and you know it's like if a anybody <laughs> mm, yeah it really is um really is I, I i don't know i'm just yeah i love it but it's yeah it's really amazing and richard um, can i ask why yeah. are radiotherapy treatment rooms so cold well, part of the reason is, uh, remember earlier I spoke about this accelerator that's a, I don't know if I said it, it's a, like where the microwaves go uh, and accelerate the electrons. Well, that's a, that's a copper tube, a two meter long copper tube that's about five inches. And it's filled with um, cavities. So basically, I'll get down into the physics now, but the, the microwaves fill up these cavities and the, the wavelength is critical to the cavity length depending on what type of accelerator you've got um, and as copper gets hot and cooled it ex obviously like most metals it expands and contracts so what we ne what we want to do is we want to keep that structure at a set temperature so we don't want it sort of because obviously when it's beaming on there's a lot of energy there um, it can get hot warm so we have this water cooling system that keeps this keeps the accelerator at a certain temperature um, and obviously we don't want the room temperature fluctuating 
so quite often that's why we have the aircon on at blowing at, blowing at a certain temperature quite cold is to assist the machine so it doesn't overheat it just helps it keep it a normal sort of normal temperature um but yeah we've we've had a you know patient saying well why is it so bloody cold i've led there in my underpants and it's freezing you know <laughs> so uh yeah with all of the technology richard just thinking for the future how are linear accelerators developing to be more sustainable it's obviously a lot of energy usage a lot of products and things that go into it, a lot of time and effort to maintain them oh wow there's a really good question um well going back to the sf6 um gas it's it's the worst greenhouse gas um we don't use massive amounts of it in there but it basically fill, fills up the uh and i remember people are going to shoot me now but i remember when i started um we used to drain the sf6 gas into a black bag and then walk out through the waiting room and empty it into the car park now if uh if, yeah you, i know it's funny right so what we used to do our mechanical engineer little dave right he was he was a lovely chap always always something going there was a disaster with dave always something going wrong he was always taking a water pipe off when he hadn't turned the pump off or there was always something and uh the sf6 gas is heavier than air so you can actually drown in the gas um so we used to drain the gas into the black bag and as he walked through the waiting room this black bag sort of bouncing around with the sf6 gas in there's only a little bit in there and you could see all the patients we used to laugh because we used to watch him see all the patients watching him go through the waiting room with this black bag and then he'd go outside the doors and he'd set and then he just empty the black bag outside shake it a bit nothing had come out roll it up and walk back in again <laughs> and you could see the patients looking like is that man matt what's he done what's he doing he's just gone outside and shook a black bag and nothing you know um so so nowadays that's really highly uh regulated so any sf6 gas is now uh, recaptured in bags and then taken away and uh, reused um, so that's one way that the uh, the sort of things sustainability is a really interesting one because I don't know because of the powers that we're using to actually accelerate these electrons I don't know really um, apart from sort of using different components to make the machine I don't really know where where we could sort of cut back on power really um, a really interesting one actually um there are some sort of solid state modulators um which might be a bit less to use but hmm interesting question so richard <laughs> um can you tell us a little bit then about kind of the outreach work that you do because as exactly the same as therapeutic radiographers physicists dosimetrists you know engineers also not necessarily even being public facing don't necessarily get the recognition um or even the awareness about kind of going into a career as an engineer working in radiotherapy can you tell us a little bit about your outreach work and maybe maybe some of the analogies that you use <laughs> in your work because i love these oh my goodness so um yeah, so the the outreach work, uh, I've done all sorts of stuff really. Um, so I've organised conferences. Um, I do try and get myself in and try and sort of raise awareness of, of engineering. So I try and muscle in on physics conferences sometimes. Um, but by far the best, well, I suppose equally the best, um, we used to do a lot of stuff with STEM with schools. So getting sort of teenagers coming in. Um, I've took me scout group into work once at Cheltenham and explained to the scout group how the accelerator worked um yeah getting those school children if you can catch them before they leave school nobody's aware that what you know most people are unaware that they that radiotherapy engineering is a is a sort of career and uh yeah you just turn up so I turn up with all my bits or uh, you won't be able to see this at home but I'm just showing the guys a, an electron gun and so I kind of I kind of roll up roll up in my car with half a half a linac in the boot and uh and display it out on the table and and talk to the and uh, put a presentation up and talk about how the machine works and the kids just love it they just like uh, you know oh my goodness and then you show them the machine and that's when the eyeballs pop out their head you know and then you explain to them well if you love engineering and you love this machine you come and work with us and then what you're doing is you're not just working on one of the coolest machines ever you're also saving people's lives and it's like 
if you love engineering, why wouldn't you want to be a radiotherapy engineer? I, I just, you know, it, it beggars, it, well, it doesn't beggar belief, it just, it, you know, the problem is we don't get out there and shout, shout about what we're doing enough, so, um, so that's why we do the STEM stuff, um, doing, so I did start a series of talks to the patients at Cheltenham, um, so once a month we'd have the patients come in for their pre-radiotherapy chat, and then after that, after the therapists had done their, uh, their chat and then we if they wanted to some people want to have radiotherapy treatment don't want to know how the machine works don't like it scared of it just have blind faith it's gonna work just wanna get on with it that's fine but if you are interested we'll take you over and we'll show you the machine talk to you how it works um, and I can honestly say that that well that that, that was born from a, a chap who came in and didn't want so he was he came in for treatment and uh, and didn't want treatment he was in there uh, so a therapist was talking to him for ages in the bunker sort of explaining how the treatment worked and he was really nervous and and uh, I'd done a couple of talks to the staff about how the machines work and they rang me and said oh Richard can you come and talk to this patient and I was like, oh, okay so I went down um, and he and his wife were in the bunker and uh, yeah sort of did a little talk about how the machine works and how safe it is and how accurate it is and uh and from that um he decided to have his treatment and and at that point i thought wow how as an engineer i've just made a difference and i could see the the look in his i always remember the look in his wife's eyes and he said yeah yeah we'll, we'll go for it and uh i thought wow i can make a difference you know um and i saw him he was in the waiting room for his last treatment when i come through and he was sat there and uh yeah he put his thumb up he said yeah it's a doddle isn't it i said well you know but it was just overcoming that initial fear that initial oh my goodness it's scary and actually once you've had one or two treatments you know you kind of settle into the settle into the groove so um from that then i decided to 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 offer to all the patients if they could come and see that and the responses were just unbelievable. People, people in tears at the end of the talks, just saying, "Oh my, you've just like, you've just allayed all the questions and fears that I've had about, you know, all the all the scary stuff about the treatment, about the machine. It's just gone, and I feel ready to have my treatment now." And yeah, just amazing. As, as what a privilege to be able to do that. Would you mind um, sharing some of those fears that people have? So, yeah, radiation being the, you know, that's that's the key thing. Radiation, people hear the word radiation, they don't understand it. Um, and it's it's interesting that the, the amount of people that come in, and even if you read it on the internet, even if you research it, even if you ask your oncologist, even if you ask the therapist, there's still a big sort of, oh my goodness, radiation. People do not understand how they've, unless you've unless you've had a talk about how it works how are you going to understand how accurate that machine is how are you going to understand what you know it's not just about how accurate the machine is it's about what the radiation's doing and all the checks that are done you know to make sure that you know in the first place you're getting the radiation into the right place you're getting the right amount of radiation you're getting the right energy of radiation you know all that stuff goes on behind the scenes and i think for me, yeah, like I said, hearing people in the waiting room saying they're being microwaved and, and their fears about the radiation is, you know, to be able to alleviate that has just been amazing. I remember there was a patient who used to always say, I didn't hear the ping at the end of my treatment because of that around the microwaves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. Richard, yeah, exactly. so, uh, what does Craig David have to do with radiotherapy oh don't even go there so i do a talk so one of, one of the things i talk about is recruitment and retention and one of the things about recruitment is that we're, when we were a radiotherapy engineer right because of all the different systems on the machine there's a water system there's a gas system there's there's electronics there's high voltage electrical stuff that's going to spark six inches and do all sorts of damage if you you know there's all this stuff on the machine right and we as a one engineer 
have got to turn up and fix all that stuff, right? So when you're looking for an engineer, you're not just looking for an en you know an engineer. You're looking for somebody who who has got the got the ability to be able to understand water, plumbing, high voltage, electrical, electronics, mechanical stuff. There's there's like I said, a gantry weighs between six and seven tons. You need to understand how to bolt some on. You need to understand how to take something off, and you need to, you know, um, you know some of the some of the processes we use to unbolt the machine. We we have to use lifting gantries because the parts we're taking off are you know hundreds of kilograms. So, um, so the Craig David thing came because I was sat there and I said, like, oh, "What do we need?" And then, oh, on a Monday we need a an electrician. On a Tuesday we need a mechanical engineer, and on a Wednesday, and then it kind of like. Oh, that's a Craig David song. So, so then I, I kind of, I weaved it into my, uh, weaved it into my presentation, and then, so I did it in the UK. Brilliant, great, everybody got it. I went over to the Netherlands, and I did this presentation, and I, you know, depending on what mood I'm in, I might sing the Craig David thing a little bit. So I went over to the Netherlands, and uh, oh, Monday, Tuesday, and as a great scholar Craig David said, on a Monday, oh, what, and. And everybody looked at me like, "Is he gone mad?" And, I, and it just, you know, when you, I don't know if you, you spoke to a group and you look out and they, like, it just goes, Oof, and it, the tumbleweed goes across, and I'm like, "What have I done?" <laughs> and nobody had heard of Craig David. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, so that's where Craig David fits anyway. And I did it, uh, did a talk out in um, Houston recently as well and uh yeah nobody had heard of craig david out there so i set him some homework to go and google craig david the day before um but yeah <laughs> if that song makes a comeback it's as a result of all your outreach talks isn't it richard oh i hope not oh yeah yeah <laughs> oh dear yeah <laughs> yeah so um yeah, so a lot of talks on recruitment and retention. That's that's something that's really uh, uh, key within the industry right now. We're really struggling. We've got a lot of people of a, of a certain age, uh, myself included, who are leaving the industry in the next sort of ten, five, ten, fifteen years. Um, it's about backfilling those people and getting the knowledge. You know, the important thing is all these people are leaving, and that knowledge transfer isn't necessarily happening. Um, so one of the things I why I do the outreach stuff and one of my passions is to to bring radiotherapy engineering to the masses so at least when people are leaving school or even people are looking for a new job they actually you know they can think oh that radiotherapy engineering maybe I'll have a look at that because actually I don't think there's much more of a rewarding job in engineering um at all and the, the the travesty is that we we people don't know we exist um so mm -hmm. yeah that's that's kind of that that's kind of my passion about why i need <laughs> you know why i need to bring radiotherapy engineering to the masses do you have to go to university <laughs> to do what you do i'm just thinking from having done stem work before people say i want to help people but i don't want to have to go to university I'd rather just start working, learn on the job, and then get going. Really, really good question. Um, so there's there's two different camps: one that says yes, you should, and one that says no. It's uh, it's about your practical skills rather than your um, rather than your sort of qualifications. I like to th have a happy medium between the two, um, but in you know, certainly recruiting engineers. I've had all sorts of like from people who have got master's degrees in anything that you can think of to do with electrical or electronics um and uh, you know and they haven't necessarily been taught any practical skills and for those you know one of the tests I do is get them to wire up a plug a three pin plug and you know they just look at it like it's they don't even know what pff, how am I even going to start wiring that plug up? You know, and these guys have got, um, you know, got all these degrees. And then, you know, then on the other end of the scale, you've got a time served, you know, one of the best engineers I worked with at Cheltenham. It wasn't Dave. It was, it was my mate, Kev. Um, 
didn't have much of a qualification to his name. But I, I can honestly, hand on heart, say that there was probably not much that that man couldn't do. He could work a lathe, he could work a mill, he could do electronics. He, honestly, that man was a genius, absolute genius, but didn't, you know, he'd just done an apprenticeship when he left school at the, at the local factory. Um, so it's really interesting because, yes, it should be regulated to some degree. Yes, there should be, um, you know, there should be qualifications to get into it. But in doing that, you kind of find that you might be pushing people out that might be really good at the job. So it's it's about striking that balance. And actually, if you're not qualified, how do we then keep a check on what you're doing in-house by having some in-house training programs? Um, the manufacturers do their own training programs that all the, all the engineers go on. Um, so it's a really interesting question because some hospitals insist that you must be registered with a with a certain body and have a degree and other hospitals uh, don't just insist that you've been on the manufacturer training um, so yeah it's a really contentious subject at the moment in, within engineering and radiotherapy because worldwide there's a recognition that we should be sort of registered in some way but it's about making sure that we're registered in the right way that we're not excluding people that might necessarily you know we're not just attracting academics as such but you know um, people that might be sort of led under their car on a weekend trying to fix their car and actually you know they'd probably be some of you know they'd probably be just as good at an engineer on the radiotherapy machines as somebody who's got a degree so yeah it's really interesting because you get really really good and really really bad in both um, and it's something that's being, you know, is being sort of banded about and discussed at the moment. So we'll see where, where that kind of goes. There is um, a lot might of be wrong. innovation, <laughs> isn't there, in engineering? Because I definitely know, uh, working clinically, we'd have a clinical problem with maybe a specific patient, and the engineers would just go, "Oh, we'll we'll think of something." And honestly, I was always absolutely blown away by you know some brand new immobilization equipment that just turned up the yeah. next day to help the patients so there is a lot of innovation isn't there that goes on in a lot of departments yes uh and more and more um that's 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 it's quite uh that's not more and more they're getting rid of the sort of mechanical engineering side of the of the workshops um which is the side that would make the bespoke uh, immobilization devices so uh, they kind of maybe tending to try and outsource things like that um, and bits and bobs so um, yeah with with the mechanical engineering side there's sometimes they just they just blow you away by this stuff that you know you say oh I, I'm just thinking about that and next thing it's on your desk and you're like what you know so uh, yeah it's quite amazing really that the work that does go on um, yeah some of the things we've made in the past and we've saved you know we've saved thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds for the department but um you know hey ho <laughs> richard we're coming towards the end of our episode um we like to end with top tips do you have any top tips to for our guests who are listening to take away uh so i suppose from a from a patient perspective uh, a top tip would be to find out a bit more about the machine and how it works um if you want to um so i can guarantee that it would it will and not just you but if you uh you know partners uh carers friends or anybody else who's helping you through your through your treatment actually you know the whole journey of you going in the room coming back out and they're just sat in the waiting room so you've gone in the room you've disappeared through some doors you've come back out and this big scary machine is just giving you some radiation and they don't even they don't even know what you're talking about so actually it's really good if you can you know if you can involve the people that are helping you through your through your treatment um to have a bit more of an understanding uh so it sort of brings it together um and give you know have some confidence in in actually what the radiotherapy is doing because like i said it does what it says on the tin so you know i think that was one of the other sort of takeouts from the talks was that the patients went away with confidence that the the radiotherapy was was going to you know i'm not saying this you know you can't guarantee cures and everything else but the radiotherapy does do what it says on the tin you know um 
so having a bit of confidence in the accuracy and and everything else of the machine um, top tips for radiographers uh, find out more about engineering because you'll you'll love it it'll help you uh, when the patients have got questions um, top tips for anyone listening who knows anybody who's looking for a job in engineering or knows anybody who who's got the slightest inkling of engineering get them in front of a radiotherapy machine just do it it's just amazing um, yeah and just if you if you're an engineer uh, I know there might be a couple listening uh, top tip for engineer is just keep doing what you're doing because you're amazing and you're making the difference to so many people's lives every day so yeah it's an absolute privilege to do what I do and be part of what we what we do so yeah thank you very much I've said I've learned a lot today um, I think something that other people have taught me is especially the physicists who come and steal our chocolates you earn it more than we do sometimes because you're there middle of the night if there's a breakdown you'll be there overnight over the weekend while we're all relaxing to make sure that Monday morning all the patients get what they need and we can do what we need to do but as you said unfortunately you are tucked away we don't always get to acknowledge all the hard work that our engineers physicists do so yeah thank you so much for all your hard work thank you for the opportunity very much appreciated thank you everyone for listening to our chat your hosts today have been Naman Joko Anson and Joe McNamara if you're utilising this podcast for CPD purposes, consider the reflective questions posted along with the links to resources and literature we've discussed to receive your accredited CPD certificate. Please complete the Google form linked with the podcast. So our next guest to feature will be Chloe and Emily, who will be discussing their roles as occupational therapists. Thank you for listening and take care.